We're going to talk in this part about the universe's nutrient, water. And I call it the universe's nutrient because it is one of those ones that isn't just needed for human health. It is needed by every living organism on the universe. So water is very special and relatively unique to the planet Earth in terms of the way we use it and need it as living organisms. We're going to first talk about our needs for water. And one of the most interesting things to point out about daily water needs is that it really is one of those unique nutrients where we have a perceptible sense of thirst. So in this case, it actually is a true systems model and that the feedback from the brain is it triggers intake. So when we talk about our need for water, it really is best measured by just kind of looking at how much a person drinks and pretty much saying that that is the you know surrogate measure for how much water we actually need per day. So we did actually measure it just like that. Daily water needs for humans were established by doing all types of research, but the actual value published in the DRI is an adequate intake value. And this again means that they went and surveyed healthy men and women adults and figured that they were consuming on average daily about this much. And since they were generally healthy people, free of disease, etc., that we could assume that this is an adequate level of intake. Now, the adequate level, again, isn't the most precise. It isn't where we've sat, you know, tons of people in labs and measured their fluid losses from all the different sources. Again, it's just by survey assuming that these folks are healthy. Now just to kind of put in perspective how much water 3.7 and 2.7 liters are, we'll kind of take a look at some fluid volume equivalencies. So one liter, I'm sorry, one gallon is approximately 3.8 liters. So the men recommendation for daily intake of fluids of about 3.7 is actually close to one gallon of fluids. And for women having a recommendation of 2.8 has actually about three quarters of a gallon per day that they're supposed to take in. Now, you'll notice that that seems kind of like a lot. Um, if you don't drink a gallon of water, it's time to kind of point out that this isn't just from drinking fluids. This also includes the amount that we consume from foods in the diet, which can range depending on what kind of diet you have, but can range anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 percent. So some of this fluid we consume um, in our foods. We also have to consider that this estimate is a little high, potentially, in terms of meaning the adequate intake, because we also consume fluids for for reasons outside of our biological needs, which we'll jump to in just a second. But taking a look at how much that is, you'll also see often promoted um, eight cups per day. And so if you're wondering, well, that seems like a lot less than you know what's actually recommended. In fact, it's about half in the case of men, the reason why is because this is supposed to be eight cups of plain drinking water. And so now we're taking out of it, you know, the carbonated beverages, the alcoholic beverages, the caffeinated beverages that we consume. So that whole promotion about eight cups of water a day is supposed to be plain drinking water. But again, whether we need that much is highly dependent on, you know, the type of diet that we have and the type of activities that we have and our age and all sorts of other factors that affect average body, body loss excuse me, that affect average daily body water loss. So we all hold a lot of water in our body and we really balance it with our intake. So as much as we consume, we actually process out because water is constantly, it's a, what's called a dynamic factor. It comes in, it moves across our spaces in our body and then it's flushed out. So we really do have this balance with intake and losses. And just to kind of put in perspective, using nutrition research, we have quantified the amount that's lost from your urinary system, your respiratory losses, your your insensible losses, which are things like your skin and your sweat losses and digestive losses, whatever we don't observe, um, absorb in our gastrointestinal tract. So if you added up all of these sources of loss, which have been measured, it comes out to about 2.6 liters per day, which again, we're kind of in the zone of where we're at with the men and women average daily intake. So it's not the most scientific um, value, the adequate intake value, but you can see that it is in that ballpark of what we lose in a day in terms of our all of the sources of body water loss. Um, we also get a little bit of our water that is produced in metabolism. So when we break nutrients down, and we'll get into this later, but nutrients are stored with water. Um, and so when we break those nutrients down, we often release water. And so sometimes we can consider this water and it's a small source, um, but about 10% of our daily water needs are actually produced in the body. So it's not preformed water that we consume in the diet. Now, again, going kind of back to like, well, if we only lose 2.6 on average, and again, this is an average of men and women of all different ages and sizes, but if we only lose about that much, why would it be, you know, so much higher 
for men in, in terms of it's actually a whole liter higher than what we're showing over here for loss. And the reason why is because we have other dietary factors that affect our losses. Um, caffeine and alcohol, for instance, these are both light and mild diuretics that make us have a little bit more urinary loss than we ordinarily would have. So these diuretics make our kidneys let go of more water, but what we have found, and I'll cover this a little bit later in the transformation section also, is that it's a very short and fast acting effect, meaning that if you have caffeine in the morning, the effect that that has on your diuretic system is very short. So it isn't like all day, you know, you're purging water because of it. So we'll look a little bit more into that, but we also have variation in the amount of water that people need and hence lose because of hot climates and physical activity levels. So again, we'll talk more about this later, but we lose heat through our skin and through our sweat. And of course, if you're sweating more or in a hotter climate, you're going to need to take in more water to replace what was lost to dissipate heat so we can maintain that perfect core body temperature. So I mentioned earlier that if you see a big range in intake or adequate intake, it's also because we have a lot of behavioral elements that influence when we drink fluids. So we don't only drink because our pituitary signals that we're thirsty and we start dreaming about drinking and guzzling water. We also consume fluids because of things that we do for cultural norms, traditions, um, and you can see in the image exactly what I'm explaining. We go for coffee, we go have drinks. It's literally, quote, go have drinks. Usually these are referring to alcoholic beverages, but we have milk at certain meals, we have soda at parties, we have all kinds of different things that we associate um, with life events where we drink fluids. So again, kind of just explaining why some of those adequate intake values seem so high. We may actually not need 3.7 liters a day for a 170 pound man. It's just the average that people reported, but including all of these different, you know, non-biological reasons for drinking. So um, let's talk about the sources of water in our diet. So we drink and we consume foods that have water in them. And so we'll start off with the smaller portion of water being contributed, which is from foods. Um, so foods is, like I mentioned earlier, anywhere from about 20 to 30% of our water intake in a day, depending on how many fruits and vegetables you consume um, and you know how many um, high moisture foods you're getting. So you can see fruits and vegetables are the highest, ranging from anywhere from about 70 to 94% water. And that's about 165 milliliters per standard serving. So let's say if we're talking about um, tomatoes, your typical one, you know, small tomato or half cup tomato serving. So tomatoes are actually the highest. They have 94% moisture. And then just showing you down the range of some high moisture vegetables all the way down to less high moisture vegetables like, you know, corn, carrots, and potatoes. We wouldn't expect those to be as juicy as a tomato, right? Um, also, fruits are very high. I don't have those up here, uh, but they're in the same zone. You've got watermelon that's over 90%, um, and there's some really high fruits in there also. Dairy, dairy kind of parallel, I'm sorry, grains, which is what's showing here in the brown. Grains is kind of similar to legumes and nuts in their moisture percentages. You see a huge range because you have things from like, you know, crackers and dried seeds and um, dried nuts like almonds, all the way up to like cooked beans and cooked rice. So there's a big range for the grains and the nuts and legumes, but the cooked versions that have soaked in water being at that higher end of the range. And then they're very dry items like your cereals and crackers and things like that are at the very, very low end of the range. Um, for dairy, I actually included milk in another category because milk's technically classified as a beverage, even though I could we could argue that it's actually a whole food. And same with whole 100% fruit juice. I included that elsewhere also because that's nearly almost 100%, but I wouldn't actually classify 100% fruit juice in the context of this lecture with foods. I think that is more in the beverage area, as is milk. So when you look at this dairy and you see a percent moisture or percent water from 30 to 85 percent, the lower end of the range is like butter and you know your creams, your sour creams and cream cheeses, and then cheeses are in the middle, and then up at that high end is like yogurt, 85 percent moisture. So the point of all of this is we do get a pretty sub substantial amount of water from our foods. And if you add it up, you know, one serving from each of these foods group, it's about 400 to 500 mLs of water. And again, this is going to be, a, 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 I'm sorry, half of a liter, which is a pretty significant chunk of your two to three liter per day need. 
Um, so looking at sources of drinks in our diet. So those are the foods. These are the things that we actually gulp, gulp, drink down. Um, and so what you're looking at here is the what we eat in America figure for approximately how many men and women reported drinking plain water. And so we're going to do these in order of popularity. So a big percentage, almost 80% of women reported drinking water daily, closer to 75% for men, but most of the adult populations report to drinking water daily. Um, I actually am surprised it's not 100% just because I, some people don't drink any plain water whatsoever. And I think actually 20 and 25% is kind of a high proportion. Um, but I'd be curious when the 2018 Haynes data will come out hasn't been released yet, but that'll be interesting because I would assume that a lot of the water promotions over the last 10 years will increase the amount of adults that drink plain water. Um, let's look at plain water first. So plain water is, again, just by definition, it doesn't have any additives. So it doesn't have any sweeteners, caffeine, caffeine. it hasn't been fermented so that it's alcoholic. It's just plain water. Um, our number one source of plain water is out of the tap. And tap water is sometimes called municipal water, city water. Um, it's collected from a variety of different natural sources. And it's processed at some city plant. And then it is sent through pipe works to our taps or our faucets. It's regulated by the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, and the EPA has developed a very strict set of standards for certain contaminants that appear in tap and piped water, including metals, microbiological organisms, um, disinfection byproducts, and these are mainly from using chlorine and chlorination methods to disinfect our water. And then also they've set standards for aesthetics, like total dissolved solids and all of the different, you know, uh, chunky attributes that don't really affect our water safety, it just kind of affects its taste and smell and appearance. So the EPA sets these levels for these particular contaminants. States are welcome to adopt more stringent regulations if they would like, but the EPA are the base minimums um, for these contaminants. Municipal water is usually treated by a kind of a hurdling technique, which is where they use more than one of these treatment methods. But in the back in the day, historically, we would use one of these. So a plant would either choose a filtration method or they would distill it, where they basically boil it, vaporize it, condense it back to liquid. Um, ozonation uses gases from air. UV uses light. And we're talking about things that destroy and get rid of microorganisms and things that get out chunky things, stones, rocks, dirt and any other types of things that we might find in our water as it comes from the natural ground resources. So tap water is collected at these treatment facilities from natural sources. It's treated. The EPA regulates the treatment methods that are used and the levels of those contaminants that we mentioned right here. Um, a lot of us at home have been curious about tap water in, you know, recent years, and I would say more than recent. This is, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Aaron Brockovich, people have been curious about water and its link to cancer and heavy metals in our diet for years. Um, but a lot of that concern has generated a lot of marketing for bottled water industry, which we'll talk about later, isn't particularly much better. So a lot of us have chosen to go with like home filtration systems, whether they're installed in our home or whether we just use something like a Brita pitcher. Personally, this is kind of what I do for my family. I rotate between, you know, we need convenience bottled water sometimes, but mostly at home we do just a lightly filtered tap. Um, bottled water is bottled water that there's a couple different types of bottled water. So first let's talk about municipally sourced bottled water. And this is kind of interesting because a lot of people don't know this, but a lot of your big brands for bottled water and like your smart water and Aquafina and Dasani, and I could go on and on, they're municipally sourced. And so if you were following along on the last slide, you'll know that that means that they were collected from regular tap water treatment facilities. I know that sounds kind of cray cray, um, but they are, they're collected from tap water facilities. So essentially they're kind of overseen by the FDA and I'm sorry, the EPA in the same way um, because that water has been monitored by the EPA. But once it leaves and it's collected from municipal tap sources, they usually adopt one other processing method. So maybe they might filter it one more time or they might add something to it like minerals in the case of smart water or vitamins in the case of smart water or maybe like Aquafina, they have a seven step filtration system after it has already been filtered at the city treatment plant. 
So bottled water that's been municipally sourced collected out of the tap. But the difference here is that once it leaves that municipally sourced facility, it is no longer regulated by the um, EPA. It's regulated by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. But the problem is the Food and Drug Administration is more concerned with the labeling accuracy of bottled water. So making sure that it says it's municipally sourced, but no one knows what that means. Or it might say like purified water and purified water means that it's purified tap water. Um, and so the problem with the FDA's regulation and the regulatory nature is that it really just looks at the labeling, making sure it says that it's municipally sourced or something to that effect, and making sure when we talk about the next category of bottled waters that it's sourced from a proper place. So the FDA's role isn't really to go back in and look at microbiological safety, contaminants, the effects of the secondary um, you know, processing treatments. So really bottled water is I won't say unregulated because, again, it's been coming from the municipally sourced places. It's regulated by the EPA and it's labeled accurately because that's checked by the FDA. But in terms of its, you know, microbiological safety, it's kind of up to the manufacturers to independently run that stuff. Um, the other kind of bottled water, non-municipally sourced, this is the kind that doesn't come from the tap. And so this water is exclusively monitored by the FDA. So the EPA doesn't set any type of standards for water collected um, naturally. And so different types of water collected naturally include um, artisan water, spring water, mineral water, and naturally sparkling water. And I've given you some examples of some brands, but essentially they're all basically the FDA monitors that the way that they're sourced and the place that they're sourced is accurate. So if you say that you have an artisan well water, that means that you're collecting it from this natural pressurized rock system that forces the water up, um, et cetera. And if you're getting spring water, it has to be from a natural running spring. And sometimes you'll find that it's okay to have it pumped, but the composition has to be exactly the same as what it would be found beneath the ground. Mineral water has minimum set that the FDA checks for total dissolved solids. And so I've mentioned this um, a few moments ago, but total dissolved solids is like the mineral content and other things also, but mostly the minerals that we find in our water. And so what's ironic and funny is that when we take municipally sourced water, like say for example, say we have an Aquafina. Aquafina will take tap water and they'll process it. They'll take out more minerals. So they'll use maybe a tighter sieve or they'll do one additional, or maybe they'll distill it. They'll do an additional processing step so they can say that, you know, it's not obviously regular tap water, but part of these includes removing more of the total dissolved solids, right? So it takes out more of the mineral, mineral constituents. But then you have over here your fancy expensive waters and they actually have minimums for the amount of total dissolved solids that they can have. So in a in a mineral water setting and even in sparkling water settings, which are high-end designer fancy waters, they have to have those minerals there that the cheap bottled water companies are taking out so they can say it's not tap water. So the point of that is sometimes we're a little delusional about our water choices and we're going to do a live session just for fun um, looking at the difference between tap and bottled water in terms of those actual criteria like the contaminants and things um, but just a few examples and then a couple little trends there's this water coming from New Zealand that's like the new Fiji the new Voss you'll start seeing this when you stay at fancy hotels um, but people really enjoy it it's got a lot of good consumer ratings um, just a couple fun things on trendy waters these didn't animate in right, so we'll just do that. A um, couple different things like we this these aren't all necessarily new concepts, but I just found images that were um, you know reflective of the messages here. Like BLK water is alkaline rich water that has this particular mineral in it that makes the water black. They have a whole line of different functional types. I don't think it's doing very well. Um, I don't hear people talk or ask about it too much. Activate and special K protein waters and these little things for prenatal care. These are all very popular to add to water or to buy bottled. So they're water with nutrients supplemented. Um, I have seen a shift from these little fancy packets that people I think are kind of moving away from into more full and complete looking powders that come in glass jars that you add water to. I've also seen waters that have detox compounds. So they say they have compounds in them that help suck the toxins out. Um, also, we see a big push in different natural waters. So, you know, this all started with coconut. Coconut water went bananas. And so now other people are trying to hop on board with, um, you know, maple water and rutabaga water. There's different ones out there, but essentially Essentially, they're extracting a small amount of compounds from maple and then adding water to it. 
We're also seeing lots of trends with water with their packaging. So we know that bottles are a huge problem for our environment and sustainability is big in the beverage industry. So if you ever went to a you know beverage conference, man, packaging is a big topic. Everybody hates bottled, uh, bottled beverages for that. So they're really working on it. We've seen boxed water. This is a pilot of a water bottle that is um, obviously much smaller, much smaller footprint. And then they're even working on edible and consumable and compostable or, you know, things that break down types of water bottles. So this is like a polymer that gets hard. It's water, but you can, you know, it's got that physical um, uh, you, deformation aspect to it. So hopefully that could be turned into packaging. So lots of developments here. Uh, moving away from plain water into beverages. So beverages have a few different categories. There's non-alcoholic beverages, which can either be carbonated or non-carbonated, and alcoholic. And these are just the way the industry looks at the different beverage categories in terms of market share and what people are drinking, etc. So carbonated drinks are a big source of our energy intake, sugar intake, and even fluid intake. Um, just to throw out a little bit of info about added sugars. So soda is 55% of the added sugars in the adult diet. So that's a pretty big deal. That's bigger than cake and ice cream and cookies and all of the other ways that we get sugar in our diet. Sugars added to foods, biggest source is coming from soft drinks. Um, we also see energy drinks having a big push, especially in younger markets like high school groups. In fact, I was reading the other day, crazy, crazy. It was an article in a um, popular magazine. So I don't know, you know, if their research was completely accurate, but it wouldn't surprise me because I have a high school aged sister and they are all drinking these energy drinks, monster and such. And they're doing it to stay awake, to study um, and to do sporting events and things like that, which, you know, they're getting a pretty good amount of caffeine in some of these. You can see the caffeination levels in some of these carbonated drinks can be close to 200 milligrams per can. I put up here just an average range of modest ones like your Monsters and your Red Bulls, but some of these like double, triple nitros can be dangerous before sporting events for these young kids. So soda and energy drinks, you know, they're big place in our beverage diet, but they are not the best thing for us. And so yeah, I'm sure that's not that surprising. I also thought this was kind of funny as just a trend to show you guys. Um, Coca-Cola, we all know Coke is one of the biggest soft drink manufacturers. They've been pushing, you know, a lot of trends in this area to natural sweeteners and all stevia sweetened, blah, blah, blah. But this one was funny. So meal kits are on the rise. If you've been to the grocery store lately, you'll see little packages of, and it all stems down from the chef, um, what are those at home, like the pantry blue apron and those kind of things where you get a little kit and it's really easy to assemble this great meal. Well, those are popping up in grocery stores. So Coke has just made a deal and I won't even say with what big company, but doing Coke pairings with meals. And so it's funny because it's like wine. There's like Coke Salmonier. Like there's now there's an expert that tells you what goes good with Coke. So Coke comes in these little meal kits and it's just kind of funny to see, gosh, these people are crazy getting people to drink soda. Um, non-carbonated drinks. Um, there are a few different kinds, milk and fruit juice. Again, like I said, these were kind of like, where should I put these? I didn't know if I should put these up in the whole fruit, uh, whole foods area. Cause they really are whole foods. Um, or if I should put them down in the beverages, but I chose to go with beverages because they're categorized as beverages with a lot of the research that's done. And also you can see that these are both pretty nutritious drinks, especially milk. This figure is showing beverage contribution of selected nutrients. And you can see that milk contributes a lot of really important critical nutrients to the diet. And, you know, add the juice in, switch up between servings of milk and juice, and you're getting a lot of micronutrients without the carbohydrates, added sugars and alcohol, etc. So we like our milk. It's a very healthy and nutritious drink. Um, and then with fruit juice, just one little thing to point out, 100% fruit juice is the kind that you just extract from whole fruit. So if I were to squeeze an orange, 100% fruit juice. Now, fruit drinks or fruit juice drinks, depending on how they're titled, those are different. Those are where you take a, you know, some fruit juice and you concentrate it and you add sugar to it and you might freeze it or dehydrate it into a powder or whatever, but you're taking fruit compounds and making them into a drink. And that's different. So 100% fruit juice, again, is where you're just extracting that juice. Oh, and I already said this earlier, um, but adding the, combining the fruit and the milk together, like smoothies, a really popular drink and really nutritious because it does a nice pairing of nutrients. 
Um, also in the uncaffeinated category are tea and coffee. And just a couple interesting demographic facts about our coffee intake. Um, so coffee is definitely popular among older people. So you can see this is looking at the coffee right here. And you can see that coffee isn't that prevalent above um, in the 20 to 39 inch group. They drink about a cup a day. But as we get over 40 and over 60, we double that to two cups a day. So apparently, you know, it stops working, which is probably also no surprise. Um, and we can also see that the ethnicity profile um, of coffee intake is also really interesting. You have non-Hispanic whites drinking double the coffee as non-Hispanic blacks and Hispanics. So I think that's kind of interesting. I don't know if that is a take on history, preferences, um, whether other populations drink more tea. Uh, well, actually, that's actually listed right here too. No, nope, non-Hispanic white people drink more tea too. So maybe they need more caffeine. Maybe socioeconomically, they have more resources to buy expensive coffee. I'm not exactly sure why that is a phenomenon, but it's interesting because these are the types of, types of things that later lead to the you know changes in our life span and life expectancy and the problems that we have with heart disease, etc. So this is a good early identifiable trend in caffeine intake between different demographics. Um, the level of caffeination in decaf and caffeinated coffees, um, just general ideas here, but about 135 milligrams for an eight ounce cup of Starbucks coffee, whereas espresso is going to be a lot smaller, but have a lot less. So it's more concentrated. So if you have two or three espresso shots, you'll be getting a lot more um, than you would in a typical cup of coffee. I like to typically blend. I like to blend sometimes regular and decaf. That way I'm in like that 60 to 75 zone and I can have a second cup. Um, but also, just to also remind you that um, it, well, this varies, you know, depending on the type of coffee and if you brew it at home. I haven't even seen Starbucks brew decaf in a long time. If you want decaf, they offer you a decaf Americano and then they give you a decaf espresso. Um, but coffee and tea are very popular and we won't go into, you know, how they're made um, and all of that good stuff. But plant-based, we extract out the good stuff, which is the caffeine, and we turn it into a drink. Um, and we see big trends in cold brew coffee. Um, I taught a food science class and I had a student group do a coconut water cold brew coffee that was actually on the market for quite some time and it's still there. It's doing well um, in more, you know, natural markets like your Whole Foods and things like that. So it's exciting, but no changes in the market for pressing on with cold brew coffees. And we're just now looking at different designer packages, glass bottles, aluminum bottles, and again, paper cartons kind of moving away from those plastic bottles. Um, alcoholic beverages. So alcoholic beverages um, include beer, wine, and they also include spirits, but I only included up here beer and wine because spirits don't really contribute a ton to our fluid intake. Um, you know, a one ounce shot isn't usually that contributory. The biggest consumer of water in terms of production is by far beer. So we could assume it plays the biggest role in our daily fluid intake, um, but wine also does also. We have all sorts of different ways that beer and wine can be made, but essentially it involves fermentation where sugars are converted to ethanol alcohol, which are, do contribute calories to our diet. They can be made from saps and sugars, like that's just showing cane. They can be made from high sucrose and glucose fruits like grapes. Um, they can also be made from grains like rice and wheat and all sorts of different grains, barley. We have all kinds of different ones that are used to make beer and wine. Alcoholic beverages, interestingly, provide about 27% of the calories that come from beverages. So that's a lot. So the next message is that all they contribute otherwise is alcohol. So that's a problem really with alcohol in terms of weight maintenance and really not advising it for older populations that are trying to have a balance in weight because all it provides is calories. And so it's a pretty significant source to do not contribute anything else. For instance, if you look over here at like the milk, it contributes 16, it contributes about 20% of calories, which is a lot, but remember, it also comes with all these nutrients. So in terms of alcohol, it's just not very nutrient dense. It would be one of those things we would call like, you know, empty calories. Um, empty, I guess, to how you're looking at it. If you're looking at psychotropic effects, it's definitely not empty. Um, so transformation, how we process water. So in this one, there's a little bit of a misnomer. So we know that this section is called you know, nutrient processing, but water's actually not processed. It just kind of moves around. It shifts from one space in our body to another. And so we'll start with how it's absorbed. So we swallow water, but there's no digestion in the mouth. 
It comes down and mixes with food and stomach acids, and then most of it is absorbed in the intestines, most being in the large intestine. And it's absorbed by a mechanism called osmotic diffusion. And these terms are often misunderstood, confusing, and even still to this day, I, I get them confused myself. But diffusion is very simple. It's just a concentration of you know, highly concentrated constituents moving away to less concentrated. Um, and so you can see from the little blue image, like just in a nutshell, what diffusion is. So osmosis is one type of diffusion. And osmosis is a type of diffusion that requires solutes. So in this instance, we're talking about salt. And I'll show you this little, oopsie. And it's not like an amazing quality video or anything, but it shows you how you have a high level of water and it's being moved over into the plasma space from the gastrointestinal lumen or tract. That water is being moved over into the plasma space because of the presence of that solute salt. And so this is actually called osmosis. It's diffusion because it's non-active. It doesn't take any energy to do this. It's just that the water is attracted to that salt on the other side. So it's diffusion in that the water is moving from high concentration in the gut to a lower concentration in the plasma, but it's attracted to that high concentration of salt in the plasma, and that is osmosis. So osmotic diffusion kind of combines those two concepts. Now, a couple other key elements here. We've got a semi-permeable membrane. That has to happen for osmosis and osmotic diffusion to happen. Also, you have to have that concentration gradient. So you have to have more solute on one side than the other. Now this brings into the question, what happens when we have diarrhea? That's all diarrhea is typically is a, an effect of that concentration gradient not being there. So if you have too many solutes over here, too much salt, too much sugar, like say from fruit juice, if you're a baby and you have too much juice or, um, or you're lactose intolerant and too much sugar got by to your large intestine, you have more solutes on this side and that concentration gradient isn't there to pull the water over here to this side, then you're going to end up having too much water in your stool, AKA diarrhea. So that is kind of the important concept of, you know, not over saturating your gut with sugars because you could have diarrhea from that. Um, now, once body water has been absorbed into the plasma or blood, um, it is distributed in one of two areas, extracellularly or intracellularly. And again, you guys, you shouldn't think of this as like its final resting place. Water kind of is constantly circulating. It's a static thing. It's constantly being pumped in and out at all times. Um, so it never just rests and settles in one spot. So most of the water accumulates in our extracellular areas. And of course, this is in our vessels, which is called our intervascular space, like our blood and our lymph systems and our interstitial space. And this is the spot you can see it's being pointed to, but it's kind of the spot between the vessels, but not inside the cells. And so when you talk about the pressure there, the pressure between the interstitial space and the vessels is called oncotic pressure. And this may be outside of the scope of what we're learning, but I just couldn't leave it out because I hear these two terms and I'm confused between the two of them. So here it's very simple and you can see it. And osmotic pressure is the pressure between the interstitial space and the cell wall. So when you hear the term osmotic and oncotic pressure in terms of water balance, it's just referring to the different spaces in which pressure is. Oncotic being, again, between the vessels and the interstitial space and on osmotic being between the interstitial space and the cells. And so most of that extracellular fluid is stays in the extracellular compartments. It's really, really high in sodium. Sodium is that primary cation, meaning it has that positive charge. Intracellular fluid, easier. It's just inside the cell. So intracellular fluid lives in the cell. It constitutes a little less of our body water and about a third as opposed to 65%. And it's really high in the positive charge or cation potassium. And so the way this works is that potassium is inside the cell, sodium is outside the cell, and actively, so now we're not talking about diffusion anymore, or we're not talking about things that happen without energy. Actively, we pump sodium in, we pump potassium out, and that's the way we keep that balance exchanged all the time. And when we talk about it takes energy, I just wanted to show you one more vision of this. Inside the cell here, there's a sodium potassium pump pumping sodium out, pumping potassium in, and vice versa. So it takes energy. In other words, it takes ATP breaking down to ADP to release that energy to pump sodium and potassium inside and outside of the cell. 
So the whole point of this is that it's not diffused, it's not passive anymore, it's active, and also it takes a good amount of energy, our resting energy. So when we talk about our resting metabolic rate and all of those wonderful things about how we expend energy so that we can eat, a big part of our energy is this, it's balancing our water and pumping in and out water all the time. So big source of our energy expenditure here. Now we get to the important concept of water balance. And water balance is a neuroendocrine process where if you feel low pressure, or you don't feel low pressure, I should say osmoreceptors, there's osmoreceptors on the kidney, osmoreceptors in the liver, osmoreceptors in the brain, there's these osmoreceptors that sense the pressure of the water. So it senses that oncotic pressure and that osmotic pressure. Senses that pressure, when pressure's low, it goes, uh-oh, we need to take action. And what happens is there's a big series of releasing of things and I wouldn't ever be super specific about which of these chemical compounds comes from you know which location at the end of the day I just want you to know that when pressure is low it means that we need more water in our system what it does is it signals a series of reactions that tells the kidneys to hold on to more salt and water. And so that obviously increases our water volume back up. So we stop peeing, in other words. And really this is a process where the hypothalamus triggers the pituitary, the pituitary signals everywhere else. And the main role player is the adrenal cortex in the kidney. It releases aldosterone. And again, that makes that kidney conserve or hold on to that water. And we'll look at that mechanism in just a second. On the other end of the spectrum, and this is called a negative feedback loop because the lower the pressure, the more these things are secreted. And it's always counterintuitive because it's opposite. But negative feedback system, high pressure, you're going to have a reduction in these things. So high pressure means we have too much water. We've had maybe we were pounding water because we were in an athletic event or it's hot outside. We have too much water. And so we also, those osmoreceptors sense that and it causes a reduction in all of the release of these neurotransmitters and hormones. So hormones drop and what this causes is water to be released so now we have less water we're holding on to so now you're peeing a ton right so this is exactly why when we drink more we pee more because of this sensing of this high pressure and these different neurochemical reactions now just taking a closer look what you're looking at here I, I included it here too so you could kind of have an idea but we're looking at a nephron and a nephron is just a cell in the kidney a tube in the kidney that absorbs water and you can just see that most of it is right here in the upfront area of the kidney the proximal converted tubule up front I should say in the nephron not the kidney um, so most of your water is absorbed right there with less absorbed in the other parts and then the second image just looks at again those sodium potassium pumps which are active they're different in all of these different spots but we focused in here on that proximal proximal tubule and you can see how sodium and potassium is pumped in and out of that cell actively. So that's kind of how our kidneys work and when we release aldosterone then it tells the kidneys to adjust this mechanism to absorb more sodium which brings more water with it. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Now there are certain factors that affect our kidneys and our neurohormones ability to do this properly, or I shouldn't say do it properly, just things that could change the amount of water we need and lose um, at the kidney level based on these factors. So if you have a super high protein diet, you're going to be having to get rid of more urea. So when we take the nitrogen off of protein, it creates urea. We have to get rid of that urea nitrogen through our urine. So urinary losses increase when you have a high protein diet, and so you might have a little bit of a higher water need. Same with high salt diet, more salt equals more salt you have to get rid of. That means more water you have to drink because water is lost when we get rid of that salt. Like I mentioned before, with caffeine and alcohol, both of these are considered diuretics, meaning that they typically cause you to purge a tiny bit of water. But what's interesting is they're finding out that they both also have slightly an anti-diuretic effect later, a compensatory anti-diuretic effect where you actually don't end up, you know, in a water deficit with consumption of caffeine and alcohol as much as people like to think. Um, really interestingly, altitude changes cause us to sometimes need more water. And the reason why, and if you've ever been high up altitude and you have to pee more often, the reason why is your body is so smart, it's trying to concentrate your blood so that it's more efficient at delivering oxygen. We talked last time in the iron lecture about the role of iron and making red blood cells. And so really how concentrated those red blood cells are in your blood 
are an indicator of how efficient they're delivering that oxygen. So when we get to high altitudes and we need more oxygen, we start expelling water so that our blood is more concentrated, more compact with red blood cells for more efficient oxygen delivery. So that's why at high altitudes, you may have to pee more, especially if you're drinking at high altitudes. Um, and also with hot climates, which this one's a little more intuitive, but like I mentioned, we lose heat through in hot climates, our body temperature rises, we lose that heat, we purge it through conduct and evaporative heat losses that all really boil down to water coming to the surface of the skin. So what are the functions? Like what, at the end of the day in this system, what is the product of consuming water and moving it around to all these spaces in the body? Many functions of water. And we're going to start with what we always do, the anthropometric stuff and the structure stuff. So it's the primary chemical constituent in our body, H2O. It comprises 55 to 60% of our body. And it is important for so many things. And in the whole context of being a big constituent of our body, it also cushions our joints and organs. So it physically protects our joints and organs from damage and the regular, you know, ground reactive forces and the shock that it undergoes with living on gravity. Um, it's also a buffer. So anything that just builds up or that could be toxic to our system, water is a nice buffering system. It donates that hydrogen ion. So like in the instance where you're lifting weights and you're building up lactic acid, those hydrogen ions from water can deacidify our blood and act as a nice buffer to protect us. Um, other functions of water, um, a big one. So first of all, it's a solvent for traveling nutrients. So, you know, blood is a water-based solvent. So super important for circulating and moving nutrients around. It also, which is a little less well-known, it collects and removes cellular waste. So the lymph system collects um, the waste from cells. So all of the crap we make in our regular living collected into the lymph, but the lymph drains it into the blood system and the blood system is what takes it to the kidneys to get rid of it. So in this way, not only is, does the blood, you know, deliver the nutrients where they need to go, it is also what is responsible for taking the crap that our cells create and taking them to the kidneys for removal of urine. So I like to look at water as kind of like the maid and the garbage guy, like it gets rid of all the junk that we create. Um, water, I've mentioned it a couple times, but you know, in more specific terms, it also absorbs metabolic heat. So water has this neat physical property to take on temperature. And so again, we start to exercise or our body temperature heats up. We have a vasodilatory response. Our vessels at our surface level of our skin dilates, brings all that blood to the surface. And by doing that, water starts to come out of our pores or our sweat glands start having the water come out of our pores and that heat is released. And I think I provided somewhere in the text and I would never ask specifically, but there's a pretty good amount of heat in terms of degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit that comes off with each millimole or gram of sweat. And I forget exactly what that is off the top of my head. Um, we also know that water is important for metabolism and making energy. So we've heard the term hydrolysis at this point in the lecture. When you take a compound like glucose and break it down, it's the process is hydrolysis. We're using water to go in there and break bonds. And what type of bonds? Like I just said, glucose or glycolysis, I'm sorry, or um, glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis is we have stored glycogen. We take water and we go in and we break down or hydrolyze those bonds in glycogen. We also hydrolyze peptide bonds. And we do these with enzymes also, but enzymes in water is the way that we break down chemical compounds. Well, in the context of making energy and energy metabolism, if you don't have water, can't break down those substrates, can't do your metabolic processes. So water is important for hydrolysis. And it's also the medium. So it's also the physical medium for the biochemical reactions to take place. So if you could just imagine, uh, you know, something happening in water, it couldn't happen in a dry space. So it's the medium for these reactions. And it also breaks the bond. So it's kind of like facilitates it and houses these metabolic reactions that help us make energy. Um, so lastly, we will talk about the feedback measures. So like I mentioned to start this lecture, water is cool because water is one of those ones where we physically get a feedback mechanism from our brain. We start sensing thirst almost immediately and as soon as we're slightly dehydrated. And as we age, it gets less effective. But, you know, as healthy adults, we have a pretty good perception of thirst and so do kids. Um, so but sometimes we don't have the most sensitive and so we can become dehydrated or we are thirsty, but we just don't have access access to water, like you've seen Naked and Afraid, you know, after a day goes by of no water, things start happening. So let's start looking at some of those measures and what happens when we don't have enough or we have too much water. 
So starting with dehydration, obviously we feel sensations of thirst. It hits the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus hits the pituitary and hits all of the ancillary organs that start screaming neuroendocrine hormones. And for some whatever reason that I can't explain, we know that we're thirsty. Um, we can detect these changes by slight changes in body weight. So slight dehydration is less than 5% change in body weight. So you're slightly dehydrated. And this comes with certain symptoms. You may not be quite as sharp. You may not be quite as you know physically inept, um, but it's still very mild. And if you are chronically lightly dehydrated, like basically you know your whole life, you're just not a big drinker. Then later in life, that causes like kidney stones and you know, even potentially bladder cancer. So there's a problem with being chronically dehydrated. But in the case of like you know I ran this morning and I haven't really had anything to rehydrate with, slight dehydration isn't that big of a deal. Um, we can always test or measure heat dehydration with our urine. So the most, you know, the most common way in a clinic setting that we would test for dehydration would be urine. Of course, if it's a severe condition, we would use plasma, which I guess I should just go ahead and <laughs> blow my wad on that one there. Um, urine volume is a good indicator. So how much someone is peeing, if it's a little bit versus a lot, but urine color is more of an easier indicator since we typically don't collect our urine, especially at home. We're not collecting it in a way that we would know the volume. I mean, we can feel but um, a better way is by the color and again same problem with that if we're excreting into a larger pool of water like toilet water it's kind of hard to tell um, but in a clinical setting where they capture it they use volume and color to determine hydration levels also we could measure the solutes in your urine like how concentrated the urea is how concentrated any of the if there's proteins in your urine so we can also get an indication with that how concentrated the salt is etc um, outside of urine, plasma or blood is the other most popular way. Um, and when we're dehydrated, we have hypertonic plasma, which means that it has too many solutes. There's too many solutes in it compared to the balance of water that's in it. And this has effects where the cells kind of capsize. They, they shrink up a little. And that's, again, boils back to that diffusion and osmosis concept. So if the plasma has too many solutes in it, where's the water going to go? It's going to move out of the cell and in the plasma, and this causes cell problems. So we also long term, not even really long term, just with more severe hydration. So anytime over your 5% dehydrated, you start having issues with blood pressure, which is why you often associate, you know, highly dehydrated with fainting, seizures, people can't think right, their mental prowess is all messed up, mental and physical performance is almost impossible if you're severely dehydrated. And you're also more inclined to fever, and not only an ability to fight fever, but also you have when you're dehydrated, you have an immune response. So, you know, the body takes seriously dehydration because you can only live about three days ish, depending on hydration levels to start without water. So body takes it seriously, initiates an immune response where you're releasing cytokines and these cytokines also elicit fever. So you can't fight fever well because you can't dispel body heat and you also are triggering a fever because of those cytokines. So dehydration has some pretty big clinical ramifications. Um, just in the, in the realm of performance, there are products and we'll talk about this more in the nutrition for sport lecture, but there are products that help you hold on to water and keep your cells hydrated. Um, so they keep water in the cell or they're supposed to, but they use like glycerol based compounds. Also, I just wanted to show you, um, not the most beautiful image, but a study that was looking at different mental, cognitive, and motor control things with dehydration. And you can see how little at only 2.8% dehydrated um, and at levels of 1 to 4% dehydrated, we have impaired recall, um, attention impairments, arithmetic, meaning you can't do math. So your brain literally, cognitively, academically doesn't work as well when you're even slightly dehydrated. So hydration is important for school, definitely for mental prowess, and obviously for physical for performances, but also mental performance. Don't forget. Um, very rarely we have cases of hyperhydration and really I shouldn't say hyperhydration is rare. Hyperhydration happens, but to water toxicity, like to where it has a detrimental effect on your health is very rare. And the reason why is because like I mentioned before with that negative feedback loop system, the sense, the second your osmoreceptors go, well, we have too much water. You start releasing more urine and getting rid of that body water. So we're good at doing that. But in the instances where you've like been water poisoned, like in the cases of near 
near drownings or unfortunately stupid people, the cases of hazing where kids don't know and they make people drink too much water for whatever reason, those instances can kill people and here's why. So when your plasma solutes are too low because water is too high, right? So now the concentration of those solutes like the plasma, the sodium and potassium, they're too low. So hypotonic solutions cause your blood cells to do the opposite. I mentioned before that if they're hypertonic, it takes this fluid from inside the cell and it pulls it out so that the cells kind of capsize or fall in and collapse. But the opposite happens when you're hyperhydrated. So because hyperhydration causes not enough salt to be present inside of the cell, water starts rushing in and that creates cells to lysis or break down, it pops them. So definitely bad to be hyperhydrated. And there are different kinds, and I won't get into all the different kinds, but you can be hyperhydrated in your interstitial and intravascular spaces, and that usually isn't that dangerous because we can eliminate that. But if you're hyperhydrated in the cell, that's when you have some of the major characteristic problems with it, like death, seizures, comas, dizziness, lethargy, all those things that, um, and there's symptoms and signs and, and, you know, people really do die from this. So it can be a serious thing, but it's very rare. I have read at one point in time, so don't quote me on it, but it's less than like 200 or 300 or it's less than, less than, no, that would be a lot actually, if it was less than 200,000 cases per year, but maybe that's not a lot. See, now I'm kind of mixing up the numbers, whether that was a lot or not. But anyway, these are the different things that we can look at to measure someone's hydration status, whether they're overhydrated or underhydrated. And then some of the different clinical effects that dehydration and overhydration has. So that's all I have about water. Thank you for listening. Take care.